The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it. Weekend editions here at Hale Varsity Radio. Presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbel uh, in studio. He just spent the night. Hope you're doing all right. Busy weekend. Good weekend. Plenty to dive into this morning uh, when we uh, look at the Super Bowl. Is it the moment? Is it the time for former Husker Zach Taylor to shine in Joe Burrow with all his Nebraska connections with his dad and brothers? Also, uh, you know what? There's uh, booze on our mind. This isn't a joke or a setup, Crane Act, but uh, you had a vote from the Regents. And, of course, uh, the week of Fred. Numbers to get in, 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. can email chris at hailvarsity.com, mark at hailvarsity. Dot com and find uh, me and Elijah on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio, Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Cranach, what do you know? What's good this morning? Do you have your coffee? I have my coffee. I have a Bengals cookie cake. <laughs> Look at you. Everybody forgets about Stanley Morgan, too, by the way. Well, I was Bengal. I was getting I was getting there to Stanley. And no, you there weren't. To, you forgot about him, just like everybody else. To Coach Walters. Me good included. story in the, in the world. Herald by by Evan Bland about Stanley's transformation. You know, as good as he is and was at Nebraska, that just tells you about the depth and talent of the NFL, doesn't it? Where you can't even see the field as a receiver. Yeah, that guy can't see the field yet. He'll yeah. he'll, he'll see the field eventually, but man, it, it right now it's it's coming down and taking care of business as a special teams guru. Yeah, wow. and look, that'll be a that'll be a pretty cool game to see, just because you know the Bengals are never there, man. It's been since Icky Woods. I mean, I know <laughs> that's a long time ago. Um, so that, that part will be good, and to have that Husker connection will be good. And I guess getting confirmation this week too that you know the whole idea of alcohol sales um, at Nebraska athletics is starting to round into form. I wouldn't say there's anything definitive yet, but writing is definitely on the wall. Uh, Like, you know, unanimous vote, and it has to come down to, you know, the chancellor has to, uh, the chancellor for each university needs to approve any kind of sale because it's a three-campus deal. It's Kearney, it's Omaha, it's it's Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Well, Omaha's already already rocking and rolling. Right. Chancellor has to approve, but, like, the people who brought the proposal was like the chancellor of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. So he'll probably approve the own his own proposal. The question is, how do you get how do you get the infrastructure in place? Because right now, getting a Pepsi or a water in South Stadium is impossible. How the hell are you going to do beer? <laughs> right. Throw, and then throw let it alone. The Wiener alone, Slinger. People, well, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Just let's fire aluminum cans into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> that would add, well, yeah. You need to shoot it up like we're playing 500, Mark, and, and fair you, catch them. We can't have any direct hit, direct it, hits. <laughs> enter at your own risk. Uh-huh. You might get blasted in the face at 70 miles an hour by a beer can. <laughs> it is possible. It, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Look, people need a drink in Memorial Stadium. Like that's obvious. You know, people have been more needing a drink there for a while. PBA, uh, you know, but it's going to be a bit like. Let alone, look, the bathrooms are going to be in more demand once you do that too. Right. Sure. Right. You got a diuretic. Make it, yeah. I mean, I, and, I was it, I, I was talking to my friend last night who he was serving beer at the Garth Brooks concert. And he was just talking about how crazy that was. And the, I mean, the university made hand over fist. I guess it wouldn't be the university. Garth Brooks made Garth made hand over, lots of money. Hand over fist on the beers. <laughs> but it was crazy where they 
ran out of their first shipment of beer um, about an hour before Garth went on, and they got a second shipment in, and then that was all gone within 30 minutes of getting it. They got it like 9, and then that was gone by 9.30, and he was just talking about how angry people were at 10 o'clock, saying, like, I can't even get a beer, but like, that's what I'm saying. Whenever you're, you're talking about just how much beer could be sold at Memorial Stadium, the amount of money that could be added to Nebraska's game day income, it, it's crazy to think about because, I mean, if I'm going down to a Husker football game, I'll probably buy a beer or two, and that's 25 bucks. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking normal concert pricing, NFL stadium pricing, maybe uh, the responsible student discount pricing. I mean, there, Trevor, Trevor will get it working. I mean, he's got a really good business mind and business sense. I mean, that's, that's a part that will be uh, handled at a high level. It, you just got to move forward, though, with it, Mark and Elijah. You just now have the opportunity to put it in the hands of your chancellor and AD, Carney, Lincoln, Omaha, and then it's still got to go back to the Board of Regents to get okayed. We were spending a little bit of time on this yesterday. And uh, just to set the lineup for you, uh, Dave Remington, Rewind, coming up. Uh, longtime Bengal. And, of course, uh, Husker great, college football great with us in about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Brandon Vogel and Gary Sharp in hour two, the Iron Horse. So do you, uh, you'll have wrestling coming up here the first part of March at, at uh, PBA, Cranach. You're going to have Big Ten wrestling. That's hand-in-hand hand where a beer and wrestling kind of kind of goes together. Wrestling fans are incredible. The rest of the Big Ten will get a chance to experience uh, Big Red Hospitality here in Lincoln and then just book it up. More, more Big Ten-related events, please. You're going to have regionals, you hope, with Will Bolt. That's his goal this year. Uh, Haymarket's been an incredible facility for for 20 years. I say that feeling old. And they have the infrastructure because of the Salt Dogs. So do you you sprinkle in kind of a one-time event weekend in the regular season just to to prove you guys can handle it? And I'm not saying you can't, but do do you let it happen? This is a special event. Like Garth was a special event, wrestling's a special event, so that's why they moved forward on this to get beer sales at, at, at PBA, so it's even footing. Uh, other Big Ten wrestling championship venues have had beer and, and alcohol sales, so do you do you move forward with baseball? Because you know if if Nebraska's playing Creighton this year at TD Ameritrade, I'm fairly certain I can get a beer up there. Can I, Cranek? I would think so. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't go to Creighton baseball games. Uh, ne- neither do I. But you, you, you can, in fact, if Nebraska's playing up at Creighton at TD Ameritrade, you can get a beer. Because you can get a beer at the CWS outside and in. So yep. I mean, and that's that was relatively new. Yeah. Yeah. No, you yeah. can always do that. Movements there, though, is the point. Yeah. So. Well, and Haymarket's a great place to test it out too. Uh-huh. Right. Crowd size, even if sold out, is relatively manageable. There's big concourses. There's, you know, plenty of space to set up stands and and all that around the entire stadium. Really, mm-hmm. um, good place to test it out, and good place to, you know, get more butts in seats. Right, like uh, Nebraska's already got pretty good attendance, and they probably will again this year. But on the crappy weather sold- days, eh, people <laughs> like to stay home. Why well, let them have a pop? They sold yeah, out. They show up a little more. Their, their reserve seating, I mean, bang. You, you blink and Husker baseball fans are rocking already, man. They're, they're so excited. And schedule-wise, I know you start out um, in, in Texas, but it'd be all right to, I mean, March. Let's look at that. You got Long Beach State coming to town. Mm-hmm. Maybe, uh, maybe you make it happen for that. Michigan is in Haymarket uh, the end of May. I mean, that's always pretty big. You got Ohio State on the road, so never mind that. And the uh, the dreaded Rutgers in April. 
So, well, while we're on the topic of the Husker baseball schedule, I think it kind of got glossed over how crazy that situation with uh, San Diego State was, where we had been scheduled to play them down in, I believe, was it Texas or Cal? I think it was te- down in Texas, or maybe it was California down there. Um, and whenever they released their schedule for the year, Nebraska just was not on it. They, they didn't inform Nebraska or anything like that. It, it, I, I think that was just kind of glossed over how, how weird and crazy that was for college baseball that we had scheduled a series with them, and then when they released their schedule, we just weren't on it. Maybe that's just me. Yeah, didn't, didn't know that, but that's... Yeah, uh, they, didn't, they didn't communicate no very good. well. Yeah. It's no good. It's awful. Uh, Fred Hoiberg, hearing loud and clear... Just the frustration level to start the week with Nebraska basketball on his call-in show, on his radio show. We now hold spent on, Chris, a lot. Do you – hold on. Yeah. I've heard folks talk about how – now, I've worked on those shows too. Yep. Been a while. Yeah. But there have been folks that have said, oh, that was absolutely directed by Trev Alberts to let Hoiberg hear about it because that's no. the university's – own property it's their own Those property but heavily screened they're not just going to let anybody through eh. i think yes you screen mm-hmm. but once hey, what you, would you get like the to people talk about on the air mm-hmm. they're just kind of on the air you can't they do are. any more screen you can lie during the screening process to get on the air do you buy into the fact that the athletic department intentionally let fred face the music via his call-in show no i don't think Me either I don't think there is much thought, to be honest, if we're putting together a, a, thing, a, a list of things to do and worry about in right. the second week of February for Trev Alberts. Right. It's like not, Trev's on his bat phone hey, calling the – Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not Trev saying, let's, let's figure out if Homeboy and Kozad can get through and light up old Fred. No, I it, no. I mean, between social media, all the different shows. I mean, we not that folks are beating the door down for Nebraska basketball, but when we take some calls on Nebraska basketball, people are pissed, but they're they're still pretty respectful. And and here's the the difference. Like what 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 was said was echoed and felt by many. This guy was speaking for a lot of folks. But then it got to a little bit of bravado and ego with, with how, how the phone call was made and I'm firing you like I did Miles. And that's the difference, right? It's like fans want the media to be as direct and sometimes harsh as they are. And from a professional working standpoint, you're not going to, from a tone standpoint, you're not going to ask somebody, <laughs> in that manner, in their face. It's like you're challenging him to a fight. Hey, dude, why do you still have a job? You're just not going to do it that way. And that's that's the, the difference, I guess. And that's some emails I've gotten this week. Is, well, why don't you guys ask any tough questions? Because, you know, we, we can talk about it. We can hash it out. And uh, it, it's up to Trev. It's still up to Trev. It's still up to Fred, really. Not, not just Trev. It's up to Fred to build on the win and make a case for future years. Now, the, the the roadblock is the obvious number out there, the $18 million, but you hope it works out and they kind of start clicking because Fred doesn't need that, uh, that type of venom and arrow shooting. And on the same token, Nebraska fans don't need to watch horrific basketball like they saw uh, Northwestern Nebraska where you get absolutely dismantled the uh, the the Fab Five traded jerseys and disguised themselves of 2021 2022 Northwestern <laughs> basketball. <laughs> it just shouldn't have happened that way. Cranack, uh, a thought from you, um, and I know you get a chance to watch Nebraska Iowa before, should you choose before Super Bowl coverage. But you know, you hope Nebraska can kind of get things going. How does the team finish out? Very important for. For Fred, when it comes to, you know, the end of year meeting with Trev, here's some proof on the court where I think we can go. And here's why we're going to be different and better personnel wise here moving forward, because the first three years haven't worked, bud. 
I think look, I think most, a lot of things can be true at the same time, and yep. I think it is very true. Fred has has mentioned this um, recently that you know the injuries to Trey McGowan's, the injuries to to Breidenbach hurt them yeah. physically. Um, and you know what, what's the element that has been missing throughout this losing streak? It is physicality. I mean, it, absolutely. Fair. I mean, it's just Nebraska just has looked overwhelmed physically. You know, Purdue was was the the case in point. Um, just could not withstand the physicality of the other teams. Not that Brian Bach is Shaq, but he does bring you something. <laughs> he's he's so, Coach Beard, man. He, he's he's physical, and he wants he'll mix it up. He'll box yeah. out. Yeah. Look. So so that I believe Fred that that did hurt the team. That is true. But it is also true that as fans. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you go over. Like, okay, you lost a couple guys, and, and that's hurtful, and blah blah blah. But that doesn't give you an excuse to go over. That is also true. Like, so that's kind of what Nebraska has been facing here. Is you got a got a team that was depleted from by from the roster, but then top that off with woefully underperforming and mainly it was mental and that Effort. part was obvious and Fred maybe not realizing or maximizing his role to get the team mentally ready like that's part of the role that's part of the job and it seems like he didn't he doesn't fully grasp that with with more of his NBA mentality of just you know guys are going to get ready I shouldn't have to motivate them you do Obviously, because they show up. Look, that team that showed up against Minnesota, again, mm-hmm. a team that's also struggling, but they looked like an energetic, excited, motivated, somewhat physical, um, and definitely talented basketball team. Like, that hasn't been missing. The, the talent is there. Bryce McGowan's two alley-oops in the first five minutes were, like, pretty fun. <laughs> Those are pretty sweet. I mean, you know, you don't see that at, in a Nebraska uniform too often. Like, hello. And then Alonzo Verge's, I mean, his first step, if that dude doesn't become a Harlem Globetrotter, I'm never watching them again. I don't watch them anyways. But they, if I did, I wouldn't well, want a person like Alonzo Verge. On, I mean, he has up, got incredible handles. Incredible snarky response. Uh, you oh. got to pass the ball as a Harlem Globetrotter. Uh, that's true. But you know what I'm Sorry. saying. Sorry. Sorry. There are players on that team that are gifted enough to be better than they are record wise. Oh, big time. Right. And then to and so to un to unlock that is I mean, it's I don't even know if it's scheme as much as it is just getting the dudes mentally ready to go. And if that's not your strength, Fred, you better find an assistant or someone that understands that and can get them going because the way they have come out flat or uninspired or whatever is just, it's inexcusable. You can't watch that crap. People are done watching that crap. I think Fred realizes it it, and maybe he realized it too late. I don't know. Maybe he's just like, Oh crap. I got to, yeah, I got to be more in tune to where these guys are at mentally. um, than maybe he thought he had to before. Here's here's the problem. There's this, and it's pros. It's the pro style mentality. Riley had it. Fred's got it, and it's not wrong. It's just asking a lot from a maturity level standpoint. And then you look at the roster, the way it's constructed. I mean, there are a bunch of different d- dudes from from different spots that all have left one spot for one reason or another and are now here, and. You, you're you're betting money <laughs> that they're gonna accept roles, play as a team and as a unit with the 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 team first being priority versus me first, and that's not been the issue. So you got to do a better job of, of realizing who and what you're bringing in. That's part of it too, yep. and and that that's been the issue as far as scheme goes. Fred knows offensive basketball. But to your point about being more hands-on and sensitive to uh, the team's mentality and knowing how to connect and, and motivate, 
Um, you know, it kind of comes down to, you know, how, how hands-on and active have you been in the recruiting room? Do you tell Abdel Massey and crew, just, just go get me dudes that we think can be fringe or, or, or NBA guys? And, and leave it at that or because you don't like recruiting I, yeah I mean that, look you're me, bringing that, in that, enough talent though and you have I know to you mesh are. it together that's the magic of coaching like like you yes. were mentioning um, mm-hmm. but I, I don't I, I, you can't undersell the kind of that motivational thing too if you just watch the body language against Minnesota very early on it was apparent that the team was pissed there was atonement they, yes right they were pissed they were playing with a chip on their shoulder it's it's really difficult to describe, but, but you know it when you see it kind of thing, where you're just like, man, they're ready to play today. Like, they are, they're on fire. They're excited. They're, like, they're, you know, defensively, they're not giving up a single square inch. Um, I mean, they were ready to go. And that's, like, your – that needs to be, like, your baseline expectation every time you get out on the floor. Exactly. I mean, particularly in it is, for, in it is Nebraska. for Nebraska fans, yeah, right. Particularly here, where we notice and appreciate that as like the number one trait, right? Of course, you want to win, but as long as you see that, you know, as long as you see that from any team in any sport, you you respect it because you know they're giving it their all, and you also know that, you know. Generally, that leads to winning. Not every single mm-hmm. time. Doesn't always mean championships. Talent's important, too, of course. But if you see a team that you know is going balls to the wall, um, <laughs> you're a fan at that point, mm-hmm. right? Like, you can't hate on that team. I, I think that's especially true in Nebraska compared to a lot of other places. Absolutely true. Hail Varsity Radio Weekend Edition. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal will rewind in just a year short from the Super Bowl. Dave Remington was part of the Bengals for uh, the first five years of his NFL career. Drafted in the first round, came in with Boomer Esiason, and uh, man, uh, right there and Cincinnati back in the Super Bowl. We'll touch on the offensive line as well with a Husker great former AD. Uh, he was the uh, the Band-Aid and between uh, the Shermanator and uh, the Moose. And uh, Dave Remington with his uh, next segment here for the weekend edition, Rewind. Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. <laughs> with Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Let's say hi to a Hall of Famer for college football, a Hall of Famer with Nebraska, and uh, all-century lineman, uh, longtime Cincinnati Bengal, and Eagle, well, an athletic director for a, a short time at Nebraska. <laughs> i got to throw that in. Dave Remington yeah. with us. Dave, we can't forget hey. the AD role, brother. How are you? Well, you know, that was a, a short cup of coffee and a, and a donut, and I was over there, but it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> Hey, it was a good donut and coffee, man. Uh, that was good to, to see you. Uh, this time of year is always special, Super Bowl, and uh, it's the ultimate prize. Dave, I wanna, wanted to touch base with you here, Super Bowl week, and just get your perspective as as a longtime Bengal when the team gets to the Super Bowl, and I know you helped be on a team and, and, and part of a, a span that built up to a Super Bowl before you went to Philly. But what do, you, what do you think the community is feeling and experience, to your knowledge, being a part of it like you were? Well, uh, Cincinnati has always been a baseball town. And when the, the Bengals first went to the Super Bowl in 81, uh, it was pretty cool to see the town just turn over and become a football town. And then when, we went, when they went to the Super Bowl in 88 again, uh, the fans were crazy. I mean, they were just excited to see them be successful because, it, because there was a long drought in between. And I'm sure that uh, the Cincinnati fans uh, are, are just chomping at the bit ready for this game. They are, and they've kind of struck gold, Dave, with 
you know, this three this year three jump with Zach Taylor after the, the first two years being being really tough for him, and then landing a guy like Joe Burrow. Dave, you've seen a lot of quarterbacks, man. Uh, level of wow with Burrow for you. Well, I just think that, that you know, his, his, he's cool. That's what he is. He's cool under pressure, and he's a, uh, he's a student of the game, you could just tell. Uh, physically, he doesn't look that imposing to me, but, uh, he, you know, but he is. He goes out there and he plays uh, much better than he looks, just put it that way. Uh, he's a guy that just can do the job, and he's a gamer. And if you get a guy like that, who's, uh, you know, has Nebraska roots because of his father. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just, you're just so happy to see him have the success that he has. And you see Zach Taylor, uh, former quarterback at Nebraska, um, you know, and, and to see what success he's had after a, a couple of rough years and see that Mike Brown has uh, shown patience with him because he saw something and he's allowed it to flourish. So you've got to give him props for, and I'm talking to Mike Brown now, uh, for hanging with him. Dave, let's go back to to being drafted by Cincinnati and and your expectations going to that franchise. You were a first round guy late late in the first round because since uh, since he was on the heels of of some good years and you know what what was the word on Cincinnati uh, as you began your career? Well, the the thing that I remember most when I got drafted by Cincinnati is I didn't really get contact with anybody from Cincinnati before the draft. So I was surprised. Uh, the The San Diego game in the playoffs is what flashed in my mind when I got drafted. I go, well, that was the place that had the the coldest game in the history of football <laughs> was at Riverfront Stadium. Yes. Uh, so it, it was kind of like I was just excited to go somewhere and get an opportunity to play pro football and uh, make some money and do what I love doing, and that's that's just playing ball. And I was there for five years. Uh, and in 87, I was the union rep uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals for the 87 strike. And that was the end of my career after that. And then I went to, uh, to Philadelphia, played a few more years, three more years there. And then that, that was, uh, that was the, the end of it. But I had uh, horrible knees coming in. So I was just happy to get drafted by somebody. And they gave me a chance. And I'll always be appreciative to that. Dave, what, what was the, the trick? I mean, it, it takes some, some guts and some brains to be the union rep. Was it? Was, well, <laughs> it, it didn't take any brains at all. It was just I, after it was over with. I go, boy, that was a mistake. But uh, you know, I don't do anything halfway. So when I went in there, I went with guns ablazing, and then, uh, you don't do that in Cincinnati and, and survive. So uh, I didn't. <laughs> I'm laughing with you. I, I hope you know that. But <laughs> yeah, so I, know, I was I, I was I was going to ask what what's it like to to negotiate something on that scale? You, you're you're taken up for your brothers you're taking up for well, your teammates I, I had i was the assistant rep the real rep was boomer esiason okay so he was he would do the negotiating with the team i mean it was tough because we had everybody you know their livelihood was at stake and a lot of these guys weren't uh, really good with money so you know we had 12 year veterans that uh, they're in game three and they're like hey i don't want any money left i go you know, we're just looking at each other like, how did that happen? But <laughs> that's just the nature of the beast. You know, they don't pay them to be uh, financial wizards out there. So uh, that was the toughest part, you know, because it's, it's, they have their livelihood and you're putting it at risk by making, you know, trying to talk them into staying out and honoring the strike. But as you see, the 87 strike was the last one the NFL had. And uh, it is really, you know, it benefited long run it benefited the players with you know just exceptional salaries now and the owners i mean it really opened up the door to a lot of money that is flowing through the nfl right now does it just blow you away when you look at denver for sale four billion dollars you look at the the price tag the cowboys are worth with jerry world down there you get in on it on any part of an ownership i mean it's gonna it's gonna print money for you dave yeah, it's true. And, you know, it, when I was playing, a lot of the uh, owners were real estate people and they got pieces of the stadium and all this other things that came with it, all the benefits. And, uh, you know, it's it's just been a it's been a, a, a gold rush for everybody uh, playing football, even the retired guys like myself. Uh, I haven't I haven't started collecting my retirement, the NFL retirement, but it has gone up 
uh, tremendously from what it was uh, pre pre strike, mm -hmm. and in the in the, in the years following. I mean, it's probably doubled. So I, I, I don't think that people, even retired players, can complain too much anymore as long as they can hold off and take it at a decent age and not try to take it at 45 or 55. Uh, but if you hold on, it, it, it multiplies pretty well. Dave Remington with his Husker great legend, Cincinnati great, Hale Varsity Radio, Super Bowl week, the Bengals and Rams. Is there... Um, is there a particularly funny time you remember being in Cincinnati? What was the cast of characters like with with that Cincinnati locker room? Of course, you and Boomer, of course, Boomer Science and Foundation, all the great work you do, Dave, raising money for the battle against cystic fibrosis. That that brotherhood's been there a while with you and Boomer. Well, Boomer has been a friend of mine since he got drafted in um, 1984, I believe. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of stories. I mean, it, I mean, it was just a fun place. We had a guy, a bunch of guys who were, you know, lunch bucket, uh, bucket guys, lunch pail guys who worked uh, on the offensive line. You had Anthony Munoz, Montoya, Kazerski, Reimers, who's probably one of the better players out there and didn't get a lot of credit. But uh, uh, and Joe Walters, another fantastic player. We were just solid and stacked in the offensive line. And he had Jim McNally, uh, the guru of offensive line play back then. And uh, so, I mean, you couldn't help but learn a lot. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and we had a very effective line, and we, you know, we were really good offensively through those years that I was there. And then, uh, you know, as far as all the all the knuckleheads were on defense, and like usual, you know, they're the usual suspects. I, I could tell you some stories, but we don't have time, and I don't want to get in trouble for these guys. Cause... Was was Jason <laughs> was Jason Buck on that Cincy team? Yeah, Jason. Uh, yeah, he was. He is the most level-headed defensive lineman I ever played against. And with. Okay. Uh, just a really, really nice guy. Solid, uh, solid human being. Just, uh, you know, just, I think, I think, guess he was a Mormon. So, you know, well, he wasn't <laughs> drinking. He wasn't going carrying on. He was pretty, he was pretty strict and uh, just a, a nice person to be around. Uh, yeah, they, they, they had some guys on defense that were, you know, getting the, almost the stories come in camp anyway. That's where. That's where your true true colors shine because you're there for at that time we had uh, two a days for five straight weeks mm. and and a day they would go on strike just to get rid of that now I mean I'm <laughs> sure they don't even have it they don't even have contact during you know summer camp or fall camp anymore uh, not as much anyway I mean we had some days we had three practices a day wow. we'd have a walk to and then we'd have a, a regular full pad practice in the morning and a full pad practice in the afternoon. Um, and it's amazing that guys would still find ways to sneak out and go out at, you know, hit the bars at night. I, I don't know how they had the energy to do all this, but uh, I guess it was experience. But what, uh, what, I mean, it, it, was, it was a fun time. Were you guys on in a, in a college dorm for camp? Where were you guys stationed? Yeah, we had, uh, we were at, what, what, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was a little call, small college in, uh, in northern Ohio, okay. maybe about an hour and a half north of Cincinnati. Um, uh, you know, it was a place that we didn't have air conditioning in this place. My God. So not only, not only was it hot and humid, but there was no, no, uh, uh, no relief when you got into the room, you just have to get box fans and have blow hot air all over the place. But then my, my second year when Boomer came in, it was second or third. I, he, he and I were roommates and Boomer wasn't having any of this stuff. He went to a, a, a furniture rental place and had, uh, he, he had lazy boys brought in new beds and then he had uh, air conditioned double air conditioner stacked in the window i don't know how he you know did this but uh why the rest of the guys had like aluminum foil against the windows trying to reflect the sun away from the room we had everything you know we had cold air blowing it we had uh, we were living the life of riley up there it was pretty good that's you know? that's that, that that's smart to room that with was, the quarterback that, isn't it that yeah it was one of the benefits you hang around the quarterback and he's going to get deals for you somehow or another. And I was like, hey, this is pretty sweet. Dave Rivington with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, Husker legend, uh, former Bengal. Dave, uh, a quick thought before we say goodbye. Uh, one, how, how you leaning? Is it Cincy or is it the Rams when you look at Sunday? Oh, you have to go with Cincy. I mean, I, 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 that, I, that's, I'm just my heart. Yeah. That's with yeah. my heart. Uh, I'm thinking that Cincinnati's going to find a way to win. They've been on the road the last couple of games, and uh, Joe Burrow's found, or Burrow has found a way to win. 
So I'm hoping they can continue the magic for one more game and, and bring it home to Cincinnati. They sure deserve it. They've, they've been on a dry streak for a long time. So uh, let's hope they can, they can bring it home. Thought on Cam Jurgens. He's off to the NFL, super talented uh-huh. and athletic center. What's, uh, what's your take on, on his projections? Well, I think that uh, I was I was hoping he would stick around for another year because he's been on our watch list, the Remington Trophy watch yeah. list, for the last couple of years. And uh, I was hoping that this would be the year. We had an Iowa kid win it this past year, and I was thinking, well, it would be great if we could come back, and he'd probably be one of the, the front runners for that award. Um, but, he, you know, he's, he's, he's a smart guy, and he's, he's, you know, found out his value is right now to get out in the NFL and, and try to make some money. Uh, so he's doing that, and I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough thing when you're at that age. Uh, I know they have the Neil thing going on right now, mm-hmm. um, but it's nothing like the NFL money. So everybody's going to be chasing their dream. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him that he's got an opportunity to go to the NFL. I hope he goes where he wants to. I don't know how high he'll go uh, simply because uh, the snap issues that he had with the shotgun earlier – and uh, with the under the center stuff was even more, you know, disconcerting as an ex center to see him in short yardage and having problems with the exchange. But I think with with the time he's going to have between now and the draft, he can work on all that. And if he gets in there and he makes a team, I can see him playing for ten years. I mean, he, all he needs to do is get a chance and get some momentum and get things going. But he's got to make that team that first year, and that's the toughest thing because uh, I don't know how high he's going to get drafted. Dave Remington with us. Dave, uh, you look at Nebraska's O-line, they made a change. You've got Donovan Riola in from the Bears. Mm -hmm. Quiet guy, super intense, kind of a a technician, and that's how he's been trained. Nebraska has some guys, has some guys on paper that are uh, highly rated, but the O-line's got to to step up specifically on the – the tackles, and there, there may be uh, a tackle. Uh, Corcoran could be moving to center. That's the word early before spring. I don't know, but uh, your thought here on, on the direction of the Nebraska O-line here with a new, with a new guy? Well, uh, uh, Don, uh, Don, Donovan, I was getting Dom, Dominic and Donovan. Right, right. Up here, but uh, <laughs> uh, he, was, he, he was at Wisconsin yeah. with uh, Huber, Coach Huber, so – I, and uh, and I was with Huber with Callahan, and I was with that group. And excellent coaches, uh, they know the offensive line better than most. And uh, to see him there, I hope he's I hope he has a lot of success. Uh, nice guy. He came. Uh, he was kind enough to come to the Remington Trophy, the Remington Trophy event in January with us. Uh, I had a chance to speak to him, and he was really welcoming. He said, "Anytime I want to come in and speak to the players, I was more than welcome." Um, so that was nice. I mean, he. He's uh, just I, I want him to have as much success as possible. I look at what he's got. He's probably got a, a, a future superstar if he works and he recovers from his knee surgery in Prohaska. Mm-hmm. Uh, Teddy Prohaska, it looks like uh, he's could be a, a future NFL and a future All-American at Nebraska. Uh, you've got Newelli, who is uh, probably scheduled to be a left guard. He probably could play some center. Um, Hickson at center. Uh I think they've penciled in Latowski uh, as left guard right now. Uh, they've got a couple guys uh, that transferred in from I think Oklahoma State. Uh, Kevin Williams. Yep, Kevin Williams and, is. And, and a... They got a they got an Omaha North grad that's coming back, uh, Anthony Hunter. Mm-hmm. So they've got they might have some depth there. Uh, as far as the other side of the line, Corcoran and Ben Hart. Ben Hart needs to get much stronger. And if he's, you know, he's six foot nine and the only, you know, I love the way the six foot nine guys look on the field, mm-hmm. but, uh, you've got to bail, especially you're going to play a guard. You've got to dig people out and you got to come off the ball hard. And he's just got to get bigger. Uh, when you're six, nine, your weak point is your back always, you know, you get guys, you get, you get guys who are six, nine as your tackles because they're, they're supposed to have range. Sure. Now I watched, I watched him and Corcoran play, uh, they got to use their hands more and not turn and, and run with a defensive uh, outside linebacker or defensive end as fast. They just got to stretch that out, get a couple more kicks and use their hands and punch uh, and stop absorbing guys. You can't. And, and, and it's, it's a natural tendency. Everybody will turn and run at, at some point with the defensive lineman as he goes, as he goes by you. Cause you, it's just, you're playing against the best players out there. 
the big tall guys have got the range and the reason they get the tall guys they got to use their hands and they got to use their long arms as a weapon and right now you're i see a lot of absorbing and turning and running and then they got to just get to improve on that they've got the frame though and uh the, the, what's what's really uh, fun to watch is the young kid Prohaska. He does a pretty good job right now as a young man, and he's uh, he's he's stalemating guys at the line, and he could be a great one down the road. I'm hoping that, that Bryce is because he's a Nebraska kid. I think I think that uh, you know I'd love to see him do well. I don't know much about uh, Corcoran. You said he might be going to center. There's there's I think, right, yeah. How tall, tall is Corcoran? He's got to be tall to be in that group. He right he is. Dad, he's not. Right he's not. Forward. He's not quite Ben Hart, but I think he's probably six, 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 seven. I mean, I think he's there. Yeah, I mean, those guys look really impressive uh, when they're stand, you know, in warmups and stuff. So I mean, they look like the part is what you want, and they look like they could be a pro offensive line. They just got to get their techniques. Mm-hmm. I know with uh, 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 Donovan. He'll have them working on their hands and punching and, and extending guys before they turn and run. And that's what the tackles need to do. I mean, I tried to play tackle for a couple of weeks in spring ball, and I was absolutely horrible. Of course, <laughs> I'm, I'm six foot one, and I'm out there trying to, you know, I'm as good against the run, but I mean, the passing was a joke. Uh, but as when I went to Cincinnati, I watched guys like, you know, Anthony Munoz, I seen what he did, and he was. He was not like overpoweringly strong, but he was just an athlete and he could he could dance with people out there and he wouldn't commit until it was the right time. And he did use his and, and one thing that uh, Coach McNally uh, really emphasized was the punch. And uh, all our guys who played on the perimeter could punch and they could and they were good kick steppers. And they and it was almost like a, a orchestrated thing to watch them play. They were great. I mean, they were absolutely great. Those guys that played for for us on the on the corners there those are some names man that you're you're bringing up on the outside at the tackle especially with anthony one of the best ever dave remington yeah. with his uh proud bengal bengals in the super bowl and some thoughts on the husker o-line dave uh we'll do this sooner rather than later always love catching up with you and thanks, thanks so Chris. much for I your time it. i appreciate your yeah, time enjoy the super bowl everybody i mean it should be a good one let's hope the bengals can find a way to win uh, because we, I don't think there's. It's, is there any players? Maybe Stanley Morgan. Is he a player with the Bengals? You've still? got you've got Stanley and and then Troy Walters was at Nebraska with Scott. He's the assistant wideout coach. He was with Zach at A and M. So okay. they've All reunited. Right. See, I, and then I, you got I, Zach. I, I didn't know about Walters, but I did know, uh, you know, that uh, Stanley Stanley's was there. on the team at one time. But do you think he's he's backing up a bunch of really good receivers that Cincinnati has. He is. So, and uh, Stanley's I, had some injury issues, but he's still on that roster and he's been elevated from time to time to, to active. So Stan's one of our favorites here, you know, and it's good to see him still doing, doing work in the league. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's great. Anytime you see a Nebraska kid out there doing well, you just got to cheer for him all the time because you know, it's just, it's just part of uh, being a Husker. You never, it never goes away. You're right on with that. Well, get some wings, Dave. Enjoy Sunday, and we'll do this again, bud. Thank you, Chris. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmitz. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll time. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it, Weekend Edition Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal is... We get set to uh, gear up for Super Bowl Sunday. You'll hear that, of course, on ESPN Lincoln, Westwood One's coverage. Nebraska basketball, Iowa. Uh, they get rolling at, uh, I think, a 1 o'clock tip on FS1. And uh, a lot to cover. Uh, a busy week. We welcome in managing editor with uh, HaleVarsity.com and magazine author with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion, Brandon Vogel is with us at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogues, how's uh, the little guy doing this morning? How did he take the marinara that uh, was was to be his dinner the last time we talked on Thursday? Uh, he's 
stuck his hand directly in it, so I think that's usually a sign of uh, things are going okay. So we uh, finally ripped the Band-Aid off and had that spaghetti adventure. So he's doing pretty well. Hand in the food, that's compliments to the chef right there. It is, it is. You really know people can't can't resist when uh, they just abandon all utensils. It could also be he can't use utensils really yet, but uh, well, I'll take an ego boost. The utensil thing's uh, overrated. That will be on full display this uh, this weekend with, uh, well, quite frankly, billions eating chicken wings, um, if, if you can find them and afford them. So uh, there you go. Vogue's uh, a huge opportunity for one of Nebraska's zone, Zach Taylor, from is this going to work in Cincy to – uh, a setup where, listen, they have been on a magical run. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 road playoff wins speak for themselves. Uh, the win at Tennessee, the win at Kansas City, and now it's uh, it's time to take down the Rams. Familiarity with McVeigh and and of course Zach. And uh, I want to ask you about your your Zach Taylor moment. What do you think of Zach in Lincoln? What what game comes to mind? Is it? some of the obvious wins or moments or is there something a little uh, little deeper cut wise with Zach and what he's done what he did in Lincoln oh I think it's probably you know some of the obvious moments I was I was at that cotton bowl uh, just in the stands not many uh, professional capacity and that one didn't go Nebraska's way but um, remember that game pretty fondly you had the, the A&M game, of course, uh, which was a unique kind of <laughs> confluence of, of events there later as, you know, that's kind of where he launched his coaching career. So if I had to choose one, probably, probably that A&M game. Hmm. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, let's, I, I, one of the games that sticks out to me about Zach Taylor, and I'm wondering if you can wax poetic on it if you watched it as well, presuming you did, the pit game. I mean, that dude got, I think it was 7-6 to six was the final. Yeah, but I think he got hit 797 times around there and just kept getting up. And it's almost like he was the one guy who was able to overcome the angst that fans felt towards Bill Callahan. <laughs> and towards the program in general, right? He was almost – it's just difficult to imagine how those years would have gone without Zach Taylor. Yeah. Um, classic 7-6 uh, to six battle there uh, against Pittsburgh the year before at Hines Field, which would have been pre-Zach Taylor. Uh, I was at that game. Too, and that one wasn't wasn't much prettier. So it was a little bit more comfortable. You know, I think most of his, you know, that pick game is is a pretty good, I think, example. And that was what his third or fourth game of his career, at well, his Nebraska career of of what you had, and just a guy who was kind of the the consummate quarterback. Um, maybe wasn't the most kind of classic prototypical quarterback in terms of skill or size you had that guy after after zach taylor and it didn't didn't go quite as well um (laughs) so he just kind of had that that gamer gene and i think you look at the success he's had now you know for the way cincinnati started those first two seasons and even early this year you know you're just kind of like oh man (laughs) everyone i think you talk to who knows zach well will speak forever about what a great guy he is and you know he's kind of got this football family and this football pedigree and you're just like man what does it take to succeed and and the fact that they've been able to go on this run I think indicates that he kind of stuck to whatever his kind of grand plan was when he we took that Cincinnati job they stuck to it and they stuck with it through through those early struggles and then now you see the kind of the payoff and things can go that way too. So maybe it's a lesson, lesson in patience overall. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Vogel's with us here on Hale varsity radio and, and what Zach Taylor's done in Cincinnati has been incredible, but uh, let's not act like Joe Burrow hasn't been a huge part of that equation. I, I don't want to call it lucky, but like Zach Taylor, the, the turnaround, I don't think it's all on Zach. I think a lot of that comes down to Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase as well, which speaks to the, the job the front office has done in Cincinnati as well. 
You're right. You're right, Elijah. Thanks for ruining my narrative. No, I'm just kidding. Um, wow. Joe Burrow, another another great former Husker. Uh, Jamar Chase, he's going to say. Mickey Joseph, so he's a former Husker now. Of course, he's got an actual former Husker. <laughs> just Huskers, Huskers everywhere. It's been a ton of fun to to watch kind of a, a similar thing with, with Joe Burrow, you know, comeback player of the year this year in, in the NFL. And he's a little bit the same. I mean, obviously he was a, a high, more highly touted recruit than, than Zach Taylor was coming out of high school. Um, ended up at Ohio state and you kind of watch now and what, what he's, he's doing. And you know, like, man, I, I know, I, I remember who Ohio state's quarterbacks were, but you had this guy and he just couldn't find the field. It's, it's a little bit crazy how that sometimes goes, but Speaking of the gamer gene, that's, that's, I think, something you can go with Joe Burrow, too, because, you know, watching that AFC championship game, you've got Patrick Mahomes over here who plays plays quarterback like he's a shortstop, and, and you've got Joe Burrow who, you know, misses on some throws. I mean, I'm not saying he's not talented. Obviously, he is. Um, but it's just not quite as refined as somebody like Mahomes is yet. Uh, but finds a way to get it done and just kind of keeps plugging away. So I, I do see some similarities there between between Taylor and Burrow, but you're correct. Uh, having him in the run that he's on currently is a big part of why Cincinnati is where it is. What a whiff by Ryan Day to not pick <laughs> Joe Burrow as the starting quarterback at Ohio State. Can we all agree on that? And I'm sure Jim Nance will hammer the swing and the miss that Ohio State had to let a talent like that get away and go to LSU. I mean, that's that's the fear Nebraska ha- fans have uh, tomorrow is is all the arrows uh, Ohio State's going to take, folks. <laughs> really a lost, lost era for the Buckeyes, you know. <laughs> I mean, you, when, you, when you think about it, I, they, don't, they probably don't even put the Big Ten Championship trophies in the trophy case at this point. It's, it's national titles with bust, and you got close, but if you played Joe, maybe you would have got one. No kidding. Brandon Vogel's with us, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine Managing Editor at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogel, we'll get to some Nebraska stuff in a moment, but want to get your thought on, on Sunday and how it goes. Uh, get the Super Bowl thoughts out of the way first. And uh, Do you have a lean? Do you have a, a feel with uh, more Cincy magic, or does uh, the clock strike midnight for the Bengals? Yeah, I think we might be metaphorically kicking this one off at about 11.56 p.m. for, mm-hmm. for Cincinnati. You know, <laughs> I, I think the Bengals gave up approximately 47 sacks against the Titans, and, you know, <laughs> the Rams come in with another elite group of pass rushers, and it, it's, it's kind of been that story throughout the playoffs for, for Cincinnati, and the thinking part of me says uh, eventually it's going to catch up for you. Like one more sack or one and a half more sacks somewhere along the line could have been enough to disrupt them now. So can that Bengals uh, offensive line hold up? Or also the other piece of it is, is, is Cincinnati going to kind of continue on this run of takeaways that it has to get to this point? And both of those seem a little bit – not unlikely, but they're just pieces that are a little bit random. So probably have to play the chalk, uh, but my heart will be rooting for the Bengals. Brandon Vogel with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Let's transition over to uh, Nebraska football, and I don't think we've talked about him very much outside of the fact that he joined the program. Um, but going back and watching Chubba Purdy, now Casey Thompson's the presumed starter, for Nebraska um, this year, the transfer from Texas. If you go back and watch Chubba Purdy, though, in high school, I was actually shocked at just how dual threat he is. You know, he comes in with a certain size and, you know, comes from Florida State, and so you might as well you, you sort of presume uh, he's more of a throwing quarterback, coupled with Whipple liking him, who's more of a throwing type guy. Purdy is very much a dual threat Um he might be the best runner <laughs> on the roster out of the different quarterbacks, ability-wise. When when you watch him, do you think he can factor in this year? Because from a physical standpoint, Brandon, I, I don't think he takes a backseat to anybody in that quarterback room. 
No, I don't think so. And it, it does provide the opportunity. Well, it, you know, I, I'm kind of with everybody else. You, you look at this and you think, okay, well, Casey Thompson just has such an experience edge over everybody else that he's a likely favorite to win that job. But if, if you've got Purdy there, um, I mean, it gives Nebraska the opportunity to, one, look at this really intensely in the spring and kind of decide what's the best way for them to move from whatever this offense was over the past four seasons to whatever it's going to be with Mark Whipple in the fold. And I think somebody like Purdy and his skill set allows Nebraska to have a little bit more gray area there than they would if it was just kind of, well, we think Casey Thompson is going to win this job. And that might mean a significant change based on what kind of his profile, his strengths, and what he was asked to do at Texas. So it's, it could be more interesting in the spring than I think a lot of us, myself included, probably come in thinking it could be for that reason specifically. Yeah, Brandon, I don't think we'll, we'll leave spring practice knowing who the starter is going to be, but I want to get your take. Whenever Husker uh, fans are in the seats for the spring game, how much of what the offense is on display during the spring game do you think is going to be what the offense is going to look like in the fall, or, or do you think – a la Illinois last season, they're going to keep their cards close to the chest in the spring game and really not let teams know what the offense is actually going to look like. Yeah, yeah probably much more of the latter. I mean, I, you'll be able to see, I think, some, some new wrinkles. There'll be pieces of it that kind of catch people's attention of haven't seen that a whole lot before. But there's just – there's there's not a ton of incentive for these teams to, to really kind of roll it out and, and just let the guys play in these spring games and we we know that every college football coach ever is uh deals with a great deal of paranoia when it comes to <laughs> scheme and and unveiling things before before you have to so i think we'll we'll get a couple of glimpses and it'll be you know it'll be what we're talking about the the week after the spring game on, on this show i'm sure because it's, it's just how it goes but how much will be there? I think maybe just a maybe just a half slice of pie is about all we're going to get. Vogues, uh, a thought with the offensive line and, and level of concern with the O line as you head into spring. We know about the injuries with with Turner and Teddy as they try and, and rehab this spring. That that opens the door for guys to show what they can do. Maybe that's Piper at center. Maybe that's. Uh, ben Hart getting some, some first team reps again because he's done that for a while. Uh, yeah, Newilly, uh, uh, the guard spot. Kutovsky's a guy that no doubt uh, the, you hear good things about. And then you've got a couple of transfers, and then kids' names escaping me, but you've got some, some portal potential too, uh, the, the starting left tackle at Vandy with three years starting is in the portal and it sounds like Nebraska has been in on him. Do you think uh, Coach Riola can can get where he needs to go? That He'll have to, yes, but I'm saying with, with all the moving parts and presumably two starters out, he'll be able to, to get some of these other pieces coached up so you know at least, alright, here's the baseline, here's what I feel good about you know, what's going to be different and new about the O-line here post-spring? And, and what are some key things they need to work through this spring? Yeah, can Rayola do it? I honestly have no idea at this point. Um, but, I, you know, that's that's the bet. I, you know, you started with what's my concern level with the offensive line. Based on where we last left them uh, at the end of 2021, that concern level is high. It's, it's got to be better. Um, just in a general sense, but it's also got to be better this year because you look at kind of returning production for, for Nebraska, and the best thing they have going for them, on the offensive side at least, is the number of snaps coming back on, on the O-line. That's the most experienced part of this offense, you know, and you've got some transfers that kind of create a little bit of gray area there, particularly at quarterback and wide receiver, but... In terms of guys that have been here and played games at Nebraska, O lines where you're the quote unquote oldest. So I think you're going to be missing two two guys through the spring that you'd probably project as starters, very definitely key rotation players at the worst on on that O line. 
if if those guys, you know, it might matter more for Prohaska than it might for for Corcoran, um, just based on how much football they've been able to play. But it might might not be the worst thing to to be able to see a couple more guys. I mean, I expect that's what this spring will be for a group under a new coach anyway. But you can try out some some different different combinations and really see what you got those transfers that are coming in will really get a chance to see if they can kind of meld into to what was already coming back. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, we look at what the O-line was last year. Not good enough. We can all agree on that. You bring in a new coach to help address that, you're, you're really hoping to, to kind of catch lightning in a bottle a little bit with, you know, whether it's coaching or knowledge or just – how he inspires guys, something there that can allow Nebraska to be a little bit more aggressive and play freely up front. And I think that's probably a reasonable goal for the end of spring. Do you notice a little bit more energy or something along those lines? You know, it all gets pretty intangible pretty quickly, but it is spring football, so it's going to be that by nature a little bit. Brandon, I think you just really hit on it, um, allowing them to play more aggressive and, and freely. And I point to Turner Corcoran against Rutgers as a freshman and what he displayed there and how, like, just the style he played with and then physically where he was on the field during running plays, which was usually downfield driving somebody compared to last year. And it's like two different players, <laughs> you know? And so part of me wonders if it really is a mentality type thing where maybe Austin was, you know, emphasizing s- something else for different reasons. And Rayola might come in and just kind of let him cut loose. Because like when you just think about that example, Corcoran against Rutgers as a freshman versus how we played last year, you do see the a pretty substantial difference, don't you? Yeah, that's that's a really good example. And, and Prohaska might fit a little bit along with that, too. Uh, we basically got to see him for one game. And granted, you know, everything went great for Nebraska right from the start against Northwestern. But, you know, there's there might be something to just kind of – you have a young guy, you have a freshman in both cases. And you're like, here it is, here's your chance. And, you know, it would make sense. It would be a little bit of human nature to just go out there and be like, okay, well, I'm going to – do what I know how to do at this point. And you may not have, know how, how to do everything the other four guys on the offensive line do, but you can make up for it with kind of effort and energy. So, you know, everything we've heard about about Donovan Rayola to this point is along those lines. You know, he's a, a young, energetic coach. So I think that's that's a big part of it. You know, a lot of offensive line play comes down to to attitude and We'll see if that's something that Nebraska can can flip a little bit this spring. Brandon Vogel's with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, a few minutes left. And Brandon, is, is it fair to say that the lines of scrimmage will be the most important factor for success for this Husker football team in 2022 when you look at the offensive line and the defensive line? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, it, it's always up there for, for any football team. Yeah, but the, you look especially at, the Big Ten. <laughs> especially in the Big Ten, even a little extra. Um, so you look at defensively, you know, you, you had a bunch of D linemen last year who, who did a lot of dirty work, and that's how this was set up. You know, those those two inside linebackers all, both almost had 100 tackles. They kind of feasted on on the the meal that those guys up front were providing by, by doing some things that aren't a ton of fun and don't get you in the stat sheet at the end of the game got some some people to replace up there can you still function that way um with a green secondary you know and, and nebraska has some experience options but you're losing three starters there uh with a green secondary that tends to matter a lot probably matters the most on defense so can you find pass rush somewhere to, to help with that and you know eric shander talked at different points this season about how Sack totals may not be there, but he thought they were doing a good job of at least impacting the quarterback. You've got to maintain that and give these guys on the back a, a little bit of time to come along. Offensively, you know, I mentioned this is kind of the most experienced thing Nebraska has on, on that side of the ball. And they went through the muck last year. It was tough for those offensive linemen. 
But that experience and those snaps have to matter going into this year because we're going into year five and we're still looking at a thing where Nebraska hasn't been able to run the ball consistently. And until it is able to run the ball consistently with its running backs, I don't think you're going to get close to this team's ultimate potential. And that starts up front as well. Bogues, what's on the uh, the menu for Super Bowl Sunday? Um, yeah, I'm going to actually just about to uh, start salting now, but gonna going to do a flag steak, keep it pretty simple, <laughs> um, and go that way, as, as you noted. Uh, I've never been all that satisfied with making chicken wings at home, even though I always want chicken wings, uh, and, and right now. Market the market's not right for for home chicken wings, so we went a little <laughs> cheaper cut and went went the flank steak route. Super simple to prepare, but you gotta you gotta be spot on in your execution with it. So we'll see how we do. Are we uh, a little discouraged about the uh, El Winginator being stopped <laughs> in uh, in Nebraska last month with multiple pounds of marijuana, two pounds of blow? Um, who knew? Who knew that Nebraska was a wing destination for El Winginator and some some stimulation also accompanied him, allegedly. So you're saying this is yeah. a guy who, like, won a wing contest? I'm so confused. I sent you the article. Yeah. What, so, so, I know. Explain but the backstory. We're trying to here. set it up here for the folks that did not see the article. Who is El Winginator? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused. A, a, a 60-year-old dude that uh, was making his way through the state of Nebraska. Uh, the El Winginator is a 60-year-old New Jersey man, gained fame in wing-eating contests, arrested last month after he was pulled over, say it with me, in an RV <laughs> with more than two pounds of cocaine and 254 pounds of chronic. Ex- an 11 a.m. His- stop... Explains his ability to consume large quantities of food. <laughs> he was using PEDs. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, the Lincoln Lancaster County Criminal Task Force found marijuana in vacuum sealed bags and a brick of coke, <laughs> weighing 2.2 pounds, inside the vehicle. There was also a roll. Of four thousand four hundred dollars bundled cash. Mm. So, do we know if he was traveling west or east? I believe it says uh, was arrested in Lincoln, pulled over. He uh, was traveling east on Interstate eighty mm. through Lincoln. Yeah. Now, oh, see, yeah, I can't, I can't help him. Like, if he'd just been in Oregon, like Mark said, he could have. That's probably a tax write-off for a professional meat eater. <laughs> Um, and it would have been totally fine, but you know you gotta. Sometimes you gotta move around, so that's the risk you take. It's tough business. Is, is there any state you can either. navigate through where you know that amount of weed's legal? The cocaine's a, a different story. <laughs> it's not legal anywhere. But uh, Cranaki, I think you nailed it with the PEDs. Yeah. I just don't know any cokeheads. First of all, second of all, I don't know any cokeheads that that are wing champions or distributors, yeah, I, I should say. <clears throat> the legend. I, w- I was thinking the weed was more the PEDs. The coke. I got. I got no explanation for that. <laughs> no, he's it, heading it, east. No, no, Maybe no, no. he was headed to Amsterdam. The, the coke is really skinny after the wing contest. Consuming all the calories. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the physique. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat it out. Well. There we go. Vogues, enjoy, and uh, get that flank steak rolling. Will do. Thanks, guys. Take care, bud. There he is. Brandon Vogel with us. Alevarcity.com and magazine. El Winginator. Let's just hope he didn't give himself the nickname. That's a, That sets up for like a behind-the-music d- documentary, you know? No, it's a 30 for 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, started as the Winginator. Now look at him. <laughs> no, now he's the junkyard dog. Okay. All right, the Iron Horse coming up. Gary Sharp will join us. Weekend edition of Tale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Glad to have you back. Yes, sir. You heard me right. <laughs> 
Here are the guys, Schmidt and Cranach. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. You're going to bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're going to bring us two more. And then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes out. Excellent strategy, sir. Thanks for hanging out. Weekend edition of Tail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Rainak, Elijah Herba. We welcome in the Iron Horse, Gary Sharp with us. Sharpie, good morning. Big weekend plans. How are you? Good. Happy Super Bowl uh, weekend, everybody. Amen, man. It's uh, awesome that it's here. It'll be sad to see it go, but we'll, um, we'll no doubt all of us be watching. We'll get to your Super Bowl thoughts in a moment. Want to get your take and, and reaction. A good story by uh, Parker Gabriel of the Journal Star with uh, pretty much the update on, on Nebraska football and the staff spending, uh, well, all staff spending time in Omaha uh, some face time with the Omaha coaches and some of the coaching clinics. And what do you believe, Gary? You're you're in Omaha. You're in it. You're up there. So are Ukraine Act. And uh, what is the perception of Nebraska in the metro? Uh, and and what what does it need to be? What what's your take on how the relationship is? And is it getting better? Well, I think it's. I don't know. I mean, Nebraska is definitely a branded Omaha. I think. Nebraska is not for everyone that plays football in Omaha because not everybody grows up in Omaha and says, I want to go play for Nebraska. It's a, you know, a community of a million people where you have people moving in and out and they didn't grow up here. And, you know, mom and dad weren't Nebraska fans, so it was not in your household. But I think Nebraska's 2.0 approach to Omaha, kind of a, a two-ply approach with Mickey Joseph topping on to Barrett Root, I think is good. I think kids in Omaha... And really, kids throughout the state, if they want to stay home and play for Nebraska, and it's a great option, is you got to give them something. Winning helps. Winning, being successful, going to a bowl game, going to the NFL, all of those things that you present to kids that are outside of the state of Nebraska, you need to present to kids that are inside of the state of Nebraska. And I think there's also an aggressive approach. We've heard Mickey Joseph talking about it is we're going to build a wall around Omaha. We're going to build a wall around Nebraska. And guys that we want, we're going to keep home. And kids also want to be looked at as they're a priority. And it's not just a passing glance of, hey, you're a Nebraska kid. You're pretty good. We're the home state school. I guess we got to talk to you. No, they're saying, you're good. It's our job to acquire talent. We would like you to stay. So I think you've seen in the last couple of months um, something that has been around for a while that Omaha is a problem for Nebraska and they have adjusted their approach and you know it's it's being received uh, very very well I can tell you that but it's not like the relationship was terrible I mean they the coaches in the metro have great respect for Scott Frost and his staff they would just like to expand the relationship and I think that's what you're seeing right now are you also seeing Gary you know Trev Trev was not so subtle when he talked about how he likes to see uh, teams and he likes to see coaches that are grinders that work harder than everybody else. Do you see maybe what they're doing within the state recruiting wise as an example of Frost and his staff kind of proving to Trev that they hear him in that regard? And are there other examples that you've seen since Trev has made that public? Well, I don't I think it's probably too soon. I think there's there's certain guys on this staff that are grinders that work 25-hour days, and then there's others that, you know, they probably they can be more efficient and they don't have to work 25 hours. I think what you're seeing, whether it be recruiting in Omaha or a new adjustment of the staff, I think there's a better organization. Uh, there's a better focus. There's a better purpose where maybe some things had gotten a little loose and you didn't know who was in charge of what or where was going where. I think now you've seen more of a focus because you have this new energy and you have new ideas and new faces where I think this is the, when you hire a new staff and you have to make some changes, Nebraska's kind of getting exactly what they thought they were going to get or needed is a little bit of juice and maybe a different direction and maybe a different viewpoint from somebody from the outside that comes in and says, hey, maybe we ought to look at this. And then all of a sudden, you bring somebody back onto the staff. You know, I'm sure Bill Bush had a big, big say in bringing Vince Ginta back 
to help organize the recruiting office. So I, I think this is all part of a, a nice little two-month run for Nebraska where they've, they've figured some things out, and hopefully the things that are behind the scenes and off the field are going to be in line where then you can have those carry over where you're better on the field. We won't know that. But to be honest, I think Nebraska has everything they wanted to do in the offseason or they needed to do. They have pretty much checked all those boxes. Now, Gary, you just brought up Vince Genta as somebody that's coming back. You worked under Bill Callahan's staff in Nebraska, then in a few other places, most recently at Baylor. He's coming back. I've, I've heard you and, and others mention how that's a really good deal for Nebraska, but how? Like, to the typical fan, they don't know what the hell a director of player personnel does. What, what what does he do? What what is he going to bring to Nebraska that obviously was lacking before he came back? Well, I think there's a I, th- I think and that's a that's a fair question, Mark. And I kind of asked the same thing because I wasn't around when when Vince was at Nebraska. And remember, it's not like Nebraska got rid of him. Bo Pelini and Tom Osborne tried to keep him at Nebraska. That's how important he was. He's very organized. He's got a good eye for evaluation and adding his two cents. But I think what that recruiting office needs is a dedicated effort from organization to identify prospects, to keep an eye on the portal, and to keep everybody in line and keep that department churning along because that is the lifeblood of college football right now is the recruiting office. And somebody like him who's come from other places and has gained knowledge and has really, really organized and has contacts, I think is important to help out with what's already in that office and then eventually to help out with the coaches when they are in recruiting. And I also think in current player personnel evaluation that is on the roster, which is pretty important, and I think you're going to see a lot more of that this spring, is you may get with some of these new faces, look at Nebraska's current roster and say, yeah, that guy, that guy to me is not a Big Ten guy. You know, that'll be a, the, the whole roster management coming up in the spring. But I think Vince can help out with all of those areas. But that area needs organization, it needs purpose, and it needs a, a very – it needs a lot of energy. And it needs, like, a presentation, like, because you're the front door to the football program outside of the head coach. And I think Vince does a really good job in that. If anybody has ever met him, he's very welcome. He's got a great personality. And I think – kids when they initially get in contact with Nebraska or they come on their visit, I think that is a good person to have as the, the person that reaches out their hand first to you. Gary, how would you rate Nebraska's recruiting efforts as a whole during the Scott Frost era? We're now getting into year five here. All the talent that's on the field was uh, brought to Nebraska by Scott Frost and his staff. So just when you look at that as a whole, uh, is it good? Is it bad? I mean, the, the outgoing departures in the transfer portal have been publicized at times, especially guys like Juan Dale. Um, but that's kind of the era of college football that we're in. So with just the talent on the field, on a scale of, I guess, A to F, how would you rate that, that they're recruiting? Well, I think, I think outside of this year, Nebraska should always be where they've been. They should be either right at number 20, inside of the top 20, or maybe 22. They should always be there. And they've proven that under Scott that they can do that. I think... You know, COVID hit, and you couldn't bring guys on campus, and I think Nebraska kind of used some of those as an excuse, and they didn't have any juice to the recruiting effort over the last probably 16 months. And so there's going to be players on this roster that should not be here. They are not Big Ten players. And Nebraska's talent evaluation to offer somebody a scholarship and then to stay in the game to recruit somebody, I think it's been lacking at times. And I think we're going to see some of those uh, mistakes that they made are going to be atoned for over the next probably spring football when guys get weeded out a little bit more. But I I think it's been an adjustment because I don't think the staff understood right away what what you needed in the Big Ten to be successful. Are you recruiting for yourself? Are you recruiting for what Nebraska playing in the Big Ten needs? And I'm seeing that adjustment now is – Got to go get some fellas. Now, everybody would love to have more offensive linemen and defensive linemen during this cycle. But right now, Nebraska is attracted to skill guys. Um, But they've got to find a way to be better in the trenches. Because once you get them on campus, then, of course, it all becomes a development. But I think the, the, the talent evaluation has been lacking. But it's better, in my opinion, of late. So hopefully that's a good sign moving forward. Gary Sharp is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio Weekend. Uh, Sharpie, to stick with Nebraska football here, and thanks for kind of laying out the the who and the what. Uh, And and I think you're right on with the the evaluation, making sure you get Big Ten kids. 
I wanted to to get your take on on the offensive line specifically, some moving parts and missing pieces as we head into spring ball here at the end of the month. And, you know, what what are your expectations? What do you think Nebraska has in Riola? And how will that be an immediate positive impact here for the kids he can work with? Well, I think, first of all, you you know, when you when everybody describes an offensive line coach, doesn't it seem guys that you always use the same same descriptive words? Feisty. He's got a lot of energy. He wants guys <laughs> just to, to be big and bad. Well, yeah, all of us know what the Riola family is like. I mean, that's they don't put up with a lot of stuff. And I think Donnie, as we're going to refer to him, because that's how he. Whenever you guys meet him, he introduces himself as Donnie. Just call me Donnie. And I, I think he's going to have a demand of what he wants out of his offensive lineman. But I'm going to go a step further on why it's a key spring for the offensive line, because the offensive line, guys, right now is a mess. It's a mess. You don't know who's going to be starting where. You're going to have some guys that really need to be on the field in the spring are not going to be there. When are you going to get Teddy Prohaska back? Gosh, he looks good, but he's still a ways from coming back, and if he does, he's one of your tackles. So it's a big spring for Donovan Riola and that offensive line because he's got to figure out a lot of different things because it is a mess on who's going to play at the five positions and who really is good and who's going to separate themselves. But I can tell you this, he will demand the most out of them, and there will be respect, and he'll have different techniques and different ways to approach things coming from the NFL where he did with the Bears for the long time, and I think that will benefit some guys that have direction. I also think guys in that offensive line, offensive line room, excuse me, will have a sense of, okay, our offensive line coach and our head coach are in line with each other on what they want to do when we run the football. I think at times over the last few years, that's been lacking. I think Scott and Greg had a different uh, approach to how they wanted to run the football. Was it the running back problem? Was it the offensive line problem? I think you'll see those two more in sync to make the running game work with the guys up front. So there's a lot of benefits. It's just going to be that's the position to watch during the spring because they've got to figure things out. Do they have eight guys that are capable of playing on Saturdays? You know, and who are those eight guys? It, it's going to be fun to watch in the offensive line, but he's going to demand a high level from them every single day, and it's not just when they're together at practice. I think he will demand that offensive linemen carry themselves in a certain way 365 days a year, and that's probably what, what's needed. Not a knock on Greg Austin. Somehow it didn't work, and he was acclaimed when, he, you know, when this whole staff came to Lincoln, but they needed a fresh voice, and they're definitely getting a fresh voice and a fresh set of eyes, which I think is important to some of the guys that maybe have not been able to break through. They weren't on the same page. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It's like it's not necessarily an indictment on Greg Austin himself, but it is an indictment on the head coach slash offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach just literally not being on the same page. I mean, they would contradict each other in press conferences um, with with some degree of regularity. One of the coaches in Parker Gabriel's article about the um, about Nebraska's, uh, you know what do you call it, clinic with the Metro Coaches Association. One of the coaches mentioned how um, Rayola, is, his style is going to be a, a little more like downfield, like all drills are 10 yards downfield, right, as opposed to walling off defenders. It's more of remove a guy, drive him. So presumably more aggressive, more physical, a little more risk-reward, a little more demanding, is that, is that sort of what you expect to see, that Nebraska is going to have a little bit more of a collision approach to their run game than sort of a wall a guy off and hope the back can find a crease? I, I think you're absolutely right, Mark. I, I think instead of a hey, running back, go make a play. Offensive lineman, make a play so the running back can get open because that is a good sign for us. And there's some guys that can do that, you know, the running game over the last couple of years was kind of, I, I think everybody has to take responsibility for why it didn't work, whether it be Ryan Held or the offensive coordinator, the head coach, or Greg Austin. It just seemed like the vision of the running backs one day would be off, or they would have good vision and the offensive line would be able to hold their blocks. So I think instead of pointing fingers, Donovan Royal has said, hey, we're not going to have to point fingers. We're going to take care of our job. And if it's, you know, we're still not running the football, it's going to be on the running back problem. 
uh, because we're going to be able to open holes. But I think that's important for guys to get downfield instead of just an explosion at the point of attack. Now, that's something that is that philosophy I've heard in the NFL. So that's a little bit of a, hey, I'm bringing this from the Bears. This is what we work on, is not only winning the battle at the line of scrimmage, but let's get downfield. You know, it's kind of like, boy, wouldn't you think if Cam Jurgens was still around, how much he would benefit from Donovan Riola? But now you're going to look for more of those Cam Jurgens that we used to see that were downfield blocking instead of just right at the line of scrimmage playing patty cake. Gary Sharp's with us here at Hale Varsity Radio. Gary, before we get you out, I, I need to go Super Bowl with you. Do you got to lean here, Rams and Bengals? Well, A, who are you rooting for, and then B, who do you think is going to win? I'm rooting for an epic halftime show that Tupac shows up. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> what are the odds on that I, one? That's got to be slim odds. You might odds. get a hologram. Well, uh, hey, hey, Dr. Dre, who nothing but a G thing, or California Love, I think will be one of the first songs, uh, or any of the collaboration between Snoop and Dr. Dre. He said there's going to be a surprise. Isn't the only surprise for the Super Bowl in L.A. with hip-hop artists is to bring back Tupac, not as a hologram, but actually the real Tupac comes out with him. I mean, I think they would just stop the rest of the Super Bowl because you'd have to figure out where Tupac has been. I thought he was killed. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, it's, I don't have a, a rooting interest in it. I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, it's kind of a different kind of Super Bowl. We don't usually see the Rams and the Bengals. you got two quarterbacks. you got Joe Cool. Um, I think the Rams are the better team, and I think the Rams will win the football game. And I actually like them more than the spread. I think they get a late score. I just hope it's an entertaining game because the last six games in the playoffs, guys, we've had great football. Five of them have been decided by a field goal, and the only one that wasn't was the Bills and the Chiefs that went to overtime. So hopefully we get another one like that, um, and hopefully it's a great day and uh, we get a great halftime show where, uh, you know, Dr. Dre, Snoop, Eminem, Mary J., Kendrick Lamar, they put on a show, and the internet explodes because older people can't understand why the hip-hop genre is at the Super Bowl. Sharpie, enjoy your weekend, bud. Uh, Best to you, and thanks for jumping on with us, man. Thanks, guys, as always. Take care. Thanks, Gary. Cranack, enjoy. Get that chili going. Yes, sir. You as well. All right, back at you Monday with Hale Varsity.